we move on to our deeper palpation generally, where I would again not start in the 10 area, but just feel a bit deeper. And, and when I do this, I always try to think of the underlying anatomy. So colon, spleen, kidney. The flank would be colon, gut, maybe kidney. And the left fossa, the female ovarian, the male colon, and gut. And here it's bladder, colon, uh, rectum, sorry, that could be sigmoid rectum there, rectum, and gut. And on this side, cecum, appendix, gut, colon, we have cecum. And here, colon, this is mostly the gut area. Okay, and on this side, I'm looking at the patient, asking them to tell me if there's any tendons. Liver, kidney, colon, ending up at the epigastric area, stomach, transverse colon, pancreas. Right. So, my, with deep palpation, an alternative method is if you don't want to use one hand, you can use your other hand to support it to try and feel deeply, but go slowly to go deep. Then you will pick up the tenderness before you poke at the patient. Okay. Flat, warm hand, and you can use two hands. All right. One week, once we've done that, I will now move on to my specific organ examination. We're going to start with the liver. And for that, I'm going to ask the patient if I can make a little mark on your body, just where the midclavicular line is, which is a very important beacon for liver exam and spleen exam. So I find the clavicles, the medial head and the lateral head, the middle of the clavicle, which is there, and if I correlate it down to here, it's about there. Okay, I'll do the same on this side quickly, the clavicular line there, correlate it down to here, it's about there. There we go. So now I've got my beacons of mid the midclavicular line. Now, for the examination of the liver, we very much stick to the midclavicular line. And that's important because the liver is the largest solid organ. It's supposed to hide under the costal margin here, but it can sometimes, as the left lobe goes over to the left side, it can come out in the epigastric area. So you don't want to feel over there and have a misguided idea of hepatomegaly. So the, the way we examine for the liver is we start by trying identifying the lower border of the liver by palpation. And that's why the relaxation of the abdominal muscles is critical in the patients lifting their, their, their knees. And then we do the upper border of the liver to try and get an idea of the size of the liver. All right. We need to do both of these in inspiration. You can also use expiration, but it's harder. But you need to be in the same phase. That's the principle. So that you don't so you get an accurate measurement of the liver. The principle of the examination is we use a flat hand again. And we try and use this part of our hand here to try and feel the liver edge. Okay, so I start with my hand in the right in iliac fossa in the midclavicular line. And when the patient takes a deep breath, the liver moves early in inspiration. So it will move out, and then I'm trying to feel for the edge. So as the patient takes a deep breath, I'm feeling for the edge. Then as he exhales, I move up, and then we go through the same exercise again. So it's feeling for the liver in inspiration and moving hand upwards every time in expiration until we obviously meet if, if there is a, uh, a, a palpable liver edge. So, so take a deep breath for me. I feel and out. Move my hand forward and look at my hand. I'm not using two hands here or the back of the hand. It's the right hand. Over here. Deep breath, sir. And in and out. Okay, move it up. Deep breath. And out. Okay, can't feel anything again. So we slowly creep up the abdomen in the midclavicular line to try and feel for where we feel the liver edge. And now I've hit the costal margin, still haven't felt a deep breath. Can't feel the liver edge. Now, in terms of gallbladder exam, if you have your fingers in the midclavicular line under the costal margin and the patient takes a deep breath and it gets sort of that stabbing pain, as if you hit something that's quite inflamed, that's Murphy's sign. It can be a sign of a cholecystitis. Surgical doctors will go into more detail about that. But it's the same technique you use like the, when you get to the costal margin for the liver. So in his case, we couldn't find the bottom part of the liver, <coughs> the bottom, the, the inferior margin. But let's say, for instance, we found the margin here. You want to comment on 
is the margin nice and sharp or is it blunt? Is it pulsating? Is it tender? And then obviously since it's, the liver has been dis moved up, you know, in either enlarged or displaced under the costal margin, you have a bit of surface of the liver which you can evaluate. And you need to evaluate that for smoothness, or is there nodules on there, either metastatic lesions, primary cancers, um, or sorotic nodules. And also you want to, when you do your auscultation in a, in a patient with a large liver, you need to listen over the liver for a systolic brewing. <laughs> which is, could be indicative of a hepatoma, which is the primary hepatocellular carcinoma. So that's the bottom margin. Then we go for the upper border of the liver, which is normally indicated in inspiration in the six, around the sixth rib. So I will percuss. So there's the, the change over. Just go inspiration and out. Okay, I think I'm on the liver here. The inspiration. Again, yes. Okay, and again. Yeah, I think this is the bottom, the, the top part of the liver, the, the, the upper border of the liver. Now, if I just look at his, there's the costal margin, there's the upper border of the liver, that's about the size of his liver which is not enlarged or displaced. I would count the ribs here if I found the rib. I say feel for the second intercostal space from the sternal angle there. And I remember I count ribs next to the sternum, which doesn't affect the breast. If the patient is a female patient, would go underneath the breast and try to put cast downwards. So you move around the breast, never through the breast. Alright? So there's the second rib. Third space, fourth space. Fifth space, it, it seems on the sixth rib here, so absolutely anatomically where I would expect it. So that's the liver examination. Always determine, feel for the lower border, then the upper border. If the upper, if you feel a liver edge down here, you don't know if it's hepatomegaly or if it's displaced. So the important principle is you can only say there's hepatomegaly if you've measured the liver span in the midclavicular line. So in his case, say we had a mark over here and the upper border is here and this patient has a barrel chest or has hyperinflation with COPD or chronic asthma and I measure the liver span, I see it's actually 10 centimeters. Then I would be a displaced liver because the pathology is actually in the lungs or above the diaphragm, pushing the liver down. But if I measured the upper border around here, say the sixth rib, and there's a palpable liver edge down here, and the span is 15 centimeters with palpation and percussion, you would say there's hepatomegaly in the mid-clavicular line. All right. So that's the liver examination. Is there any questions about the liver exam? Yes? So you just feel, listen over the liver. That's what I'm listening for here. The friction rub, which is a very rare condition that you can pick up with an acute inflammation, I don't think is of that clinical importance. No, I would. I personally would not listen routinely for a friction rub unless the patient's acutely unwell with hepatitis. The brewery, I would listen for a patient with hepatomegaly. Yeah. Well, you can argue that a patient who's got a hepatoma in there has not, who hasn't got an enlarged liver yet, uh, might have a brewery palpable, but we would have thought that by the time the brewery becomes audible and the tumor is that big, there will be a palpable liver down here. Right, so now we move on to the spleen. Yes? Can I just quickly ask, um, with the measurement of the liver, how much leniency can you give? Talina O'Connor says that the, the, the normally with the palpation technique, and you make a little mark after consenting the patient in inspiration and determining the upper border in inspiration and then measuring that between those two points, you normally underestimate the size of the liver by two to three centimeters anyway. So we would take that as about 13 centimeters as an enlarged liver, uh, above 13. So up to 13 is considered normal, but above, so 14 and above is hepatomegaly. So it's normally even an underestimation. If you have a patient with a rock hard abdomen or a very powerful six pack, then you can use percussion to find the, the bottom, uh, uh, lower edge of the liver. That's even less accurate, so then we work on 15 centimeters with percussion and percussion. 
the spleen exam. The spleen enlarges inframedially. Remember, the liver enlarges inferiorly. So the spleen is traditionally, we would, we would also examine from the right elect fossa in exactly the same technique with inspiration and expiration, moving and feeling for meeting the spleen. The spleen, exactly like the liver, moves early in inspiration. So we use inspiration also in terms of palpating the spleen. I put my left hand when I start doing this examination on the bow, bottom part of the rib cage and try to pull a skin fold towards me. I'm not lifting the spleen out of the chest because there's ribs here. I'm merely creating a skin fold to get easier under the rib cage there. All right? That's an important concept. So I would again start from over here, ask the patient to take a deep breath and feel if I can feel the notch of the sp or the spleen as I go across. Out and in, and out and in, and out and in, and out and in, and out and in. Note that when I get to the end of the, the, the costal margin, my hands can get nice and underneath the costal margin because of the skin fold I've created, as opposed to being stuck there, if I create the skin fold, I can get nice and deep. Remember, not the same as with the liver exam, that you can have a palpable liver that's not pathological, it could be displaced. The spleen is actually a quite small organ that sits here in the, anti the mid-exillary line around ribs 9, 10 and 11, which if you feel a spleen, it's pathological. It's probably one and a half to two times in loss. So in the supine position, with the skin fold in place from the right iliac fossa, we do exactly the same as for the liver, and then we try and feel if we can feel the spleen. If we can't feel the spleen, we must turn the patient to the right side and refill. Maybe with gravity, the spleen will now move a bit closer that we can actually try and feel it. And I'll demonstrate for that for you in a moment. But let's say, for instance, that we had a spleen that was over there, and now we would like to measure the size of the spleen. So with the liver, we go upper border, lower border, and measure the span. The spleen is different. We use the midclavicular line where that crosses the costal margin, that point, and the area of the largest part that we could feel for the spleen, where is the furthest away from that point. And we make that mark, and we measure with our tape the distance between the costal margin, the midclavicular crossing, and the furthest away point of the spleen. And if it's zero to four centimeters, that has a different differential from five, uh, five to eight centimeters, and then over eight centimeters, we call it a massive spleen. Or if the spleen crosses the midline, that is also a massive spleen. So it's very important to correctly examine and measure for the spleen. You could at this stage also do percussion of the spleen. So normally, in Trauber's space, which is in the anterior auxiliary line, at the lowest intercostal space, you would percuss there, you would expect to have it, like this, resonant because of the colic flexure that sits here, which has got air in it normally. But now the, the spleen is a solid organ, like the liver. So when we percussed over the liver, we had dullness. So what would happen, if the spleen starts enlarging but is not yet palpable, even supine or on the right uh, lateral position, it might already start displacing the colon. So then in this space, the percussion note will turn from resonant to dull as the spleen enlarges. So that's the very sensitive early, probably the quickest way to pick up the spleen is enlarging. So that because the spleen moves in inspiration, just take a deep breath for me. It remains resonant. Of course, you can you push it down with the diaphragm and it can move over the, the area and becomes dull. Do you follow that? Yeah, that's what, yeah. Okay, turn on the right hand side for me, just move around, come here, Tien, just turn with your head, I just want to demonstrate what we do. I'm just turning around that you can see. So, say for you, we turn the patient, now we didn't feel a spleen supine, we turn the patient towards us, ask the patient to give his hand there. And I do, remember now that we've realized we don't have a massive spleen here, I just want to check if the spleen hasn't maybe been moved under the costal margin because of gravity. So again, I would make my skin flap and just do the final bits of the examination to feel under the costal margin if I can maybe now feel this. 
which might have moved a bit in gravity. Okay, that's basically this maneuver, which you always do if you don't feel a spleen in the supine position. All right? Thank you, teacher. Please move back. Okay, so that's the spleen exam. Now I'm going to, is there any questions about the spleen examination? Actually quite straightforward in that regard. Now we're going to move, yes. So when you do the maneuver and put them on the side, are you going to measure the same way and um, use exactly the same, the same. references? Yeah, but you would expect to have a, quite a small, you won't expect a big spleen because otherwise it would be palpable in the supine position. So you're probably going to end up either with something between zero and three centimeters. So now we move on to the kidney, and remember I showed you where the renal angle watch is now. So what I do is with my left hand, I feel down the rib cage until I feel there's the renal angle, which is a nice soft pouch under the 12 rib, but lateral to the erectospinous muscle. And I put these four fingers in the pouch, in the pouch, because now my fingers will sort of be over the bottom pole of the kidney. And then, if you can imagine my hand now being under the patient, I'm trying with this hand to try and bring it over these two fingers and try to blot in between a kidney, which means if I lift and there's a mass, it will displace the mass and I'll feel it on this side. If I press down, I will feel it on the other side. So that's sort of the blotment maneuver. And after we've done that, because the kidney moves late in inspiration, we ask the patient to take a deep breath, which will at the end of inspiration, we have the kidney displaced down and we try to feel if we can catch the kidney. And as he exhales, feel if there's a give. Okay, so but that's quite rare because you need a very large kidney to feel major kidney enlargement, like in polycystic kidney disease or a tumor at the bottom pole of the kidney. So I put my fingers in there, my right hand over my head, and I'm trying to feel right down and lift bottom and push down at the top to feel if I can feel something in between, like a tumor or a big kidney. And ask the patient to take a deep breath for me, sir. Hold it there. Feel, okay, and let go. See if there was a, a give as that mass moves back with, with exhalation. So that's the, the technique for belopment of the kidney. And I do the same. So on the, on the right hand side, I would put my left hand under the patient. Don't ask if they normally lift their body up, but they shouldn't do that. In the, um, the right side um, renal angle, fingers on top of it, just below the costal margin, and I try to feel there's a mass between my fingers, sort of this movement. Okay. And again, deep breath for me, sir. And then I feel if I can catch something and let go. No, there's no give. Okay. So that's the examination of the kidney. It's quite fast, important. It's rare to find a big kidney, but you must always examine for the kidney. Now, you can think about how would you discriminate between a mass here that is it a liver or a kidney? Well, if it's a mass and it moves early in inspiration, it's probably liver. If you can't get your fingers between the mass and the costal margin, probably liver. Kidney is lower down and you'll get in between. Same with the spleen. It moves early in inspiration, kidney moves late, and the spleen you can't get your fingers between the mass and the costal margin, whereas with the kidney you can. Question at the back. Um, if you belot the kidney, would you only be able to feel it if it's enlarged? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's the kidney exam. Now, remember we did with, I spoke to you about the triple A, which is the abdominal aortic aneurysm. So if you feel for the patient's uh, epigastric area, you probably would have felt it in deep uh, when you did your palpation of the abdomen. And now you would feel, like, oh, there's a prominent pulsation here. And then what we normally say is, you put your fingers on the side and see, can I still feel the pulsation? Because if it's transmitted from an aorta in the deep, it will go probably more vertical, the transmission of the, of the uh, pulsation waves. However, if I feel it on the side here, and it also goes like this, you would think that that expansile mass or that expansile uh, uh, percussion or expansile pulsation. pulsation. Yeah. So that's why you do it. And you can narrow it down until you feel the pulsation again, and then you probably see it's quite a narrow stretch. All right. Then we get to um, the, the abdomen in terms of for percussion that we want to do for ascites. And remember, the base test for ascites, or the first thing we do is, I wouldn't say it's the base, but the first thing is looking at the flanks and the umbilicus as they're bulging. And now this is an important one, is how to understand the shifting dullness test. 
If there's fluid in the peritoneal cavity, the fluid will lie at the back because it's heavy, much more heavy than the gut with air in it, which will float on top like a boat on top of the ocean. Right? Now, as you can imagine, because there's, the fluid lies in the, in the abdomen, there will be a line on the side where you would probably go from resonant percussion of the gut with air in it to dull when you hit fluid. So the principle of the test is to demonstrate that the fluid is moving and then the dullness is shifting then. Now there's two ways to do this. The way that I normally per perform the exam is I will start in the midline, we always do that, percuss, until I go from resonant to dull. Now Tien's doesn't have fluid in his abdomen. So, but let's say, for instance, it's over here, I've heard the dullness, which then sounds like this. It's supposed to dull. Okay. Now, there's the dull area. So, that's sort of where the gut is now ending on top of the fluid level. If I now turn the patient towards me, and like on his right-hand side, and just let the fluid settle, the fluid will now all move down towards the bed which means this part is now going to be at the top. So this way where it was now dull and the gut lies on the top will become resonant. So turn towards me quickly. Yes. So we do this, let the patient lie like that and just let the fluid settle for about half a minute. And now we repercuss on our mark there where it was dull. And now it's nice and resonant. So we had shifting dullness. Where it was dull, it's now resonant because the gut has moved into that area and the fluid has moved away. You can obviously also do the test, and I'll just turn back like this for me. If you percussed towards you and you made a mark where the dullness starts on this end, and you turn the patient towards you, and the fluid now fills the, the bottom part of the abdomen on the lateral position, the dull area will increase because the fluid has moved down. All right? So now you have shifting dullness again. This way it moved away, here it increased. That's the principle of the shifting dullness test for ascites. The next test you can do if there's large, you need big fluid. Yes, that's a question. Um, you don't measure the shifting, you just say it's either there or it's isn't. Yeah, it's not a five centimeter shift, no. It's the shifting dullness. So the next one is when you have a large amount of fluid in the peritoneal cavity and you want to do the fluid thrill test. Now, if I put my hand here and I give a tap on the patient's abdomen here, it can also go through the abdominal wall with the skin and the fatty tissue or through the fluid. So to differentiate between those two, I ask the patient to just put his hand over here or a colleague, nurse, colleague, or whoever, to just put their hand over here so to prevent the thrill that I'm giving on this side to travel through the abdominal wall. So if, his head, if I ask him to put his hand there and I put my hand there and I just tap on this side or give it a little flick, I'm trying to feel if I can feel a thrill that comes through to my hand on the other side which is traveled through the fluid as opposed to through the abdominal wall which is now blocked essentially. So that's the fluid thrill test which is highly indicative of ascites. Okay, so then we can, can, can move on to auscultation of the abdomen which is essentially you place your stethoscope, as Tali teaches, at the bottom part of the umbilicus and you just listen for bowel sound. You listen for up to four minutes. If you don't hear anything in four minutes on the watch, you can say that this patient has ileus, there's no peristaltic movements. Okay? And then I will also listen for renal artery stenosis, which is that systolic bruit, on either side of the umbilicus. Now remember, as I taught you in the clinical reasoning, that the patient's hypertension, if you take the blood pressure initially, will probably alert you to check for renal artery stenosis, because it's a secondary cause of hypertension. Like which other condition in the cardiac exam? We did radio, radio, and radio femoral delay for that. Co-optation of the aorta. That's so also a sign. If you, you pick up hypertension in a young man, you would say, is, he, is there coarctation? Is there renal artery stenosis? What is this? Is there secondary causes for the hypertension? All right. So that's essentially where you auscultate. If you had a big liver, 
hepatomegaly, I will also listen over the surface of the liver for a systolic brewery of a hepatoma. If you think the patient is in acute um, hepatitis, jaundice, feverish, tender hepatomegaly, you might want to listen for a friction rub, which is essentially just that inflamed capsule of the liver rubbing against the inside of the ribs. Very rare to hear it. You could also listen in a patient with portal hypertension, so cirrhosis with engorged portal vein, maybe with splenomegaly and with varices or caboclusae. You can listen over the um, epigastric area for a venous hum, which I've never heard before, but it's it's a continuous humming lower pitch from apparently from the congestive signs of the of the uh, portal vein. Okay. But those are, I wouldn't say that's important. Okay, the important ones is the, the bowel sounds for renal artery stenosis. You can obviously also listen over the renal angle for the renal artery because it's a retroperitoneal also. Some books teach listening over the posterior and the renal angles for renal artery stenosis. Okay, so that, so normally we would then go on to a testicular and a groin exam, part of the abdomen and the lymph nodes. and. Um, for, for, for hernias, we, we're not going to do that now. And then we'll move to the legs, which is essentially an inspection of bruising in the legs, edema, and we'll do the test that, like we taught for cardio for pitting edema. And then I do a neuro exam on the feet to see if there's peripheral neuropathy from alcoholism. And that will conclude my exam with a rectal exam, left lateral position for the feces, for prostate in a man, and for tumors. Um, take temperature of the patient, which is normally done at the beginning of the exam with the observations, and do a urine dipstick for protein, blood, or bilirubin. So you look for diseases that would have been excreted in the urine dipstick.